Welcome to our, uh, our session today on the importance of community and connection. Um, I'll get started right away. Um, but just to say, glad you're here. Hope everyone is having a good summer, unless you're in the Southern Hemisphere, and then I hope you're having a good winter. <laughs> uh, summer has been great in Nova Scotia. Um, we seem to be one of the few places on the planet that isn't having um, weather emergencies. Um, and it's been a kind of hot, but not ridiculously hot, um, hot and sunny summer for the most part. So that's, that's kind of nice. I've been enjoying that part of it. So let's start with our, um, our prayer and invocation and get ourselves in the, in the right space for learning. So we call on our heavenly father, our earthly mother, our higher selves and healing guides for all those present and for anyone watching on recordings. We ask you to be present here with us as we go through this learning and to inspire us and our community to bring such lessons into our lives for our highest benefit and the highest good of those we are in community with. Amen. So um, this is the month that we discuss community and connection, because on Canadian calendars, August is the month and summer is the time when many communities, whether they're geographic communities or just uh, groups of similar interests, hold public celebrations of themselves, their communities and their collective history. So this is the month that I chose to talk about community and connection as, as it is important to us humans. So we're not alone here on Earth, in the cosmos, or even in our own bodies, which have more non-human cells than human ones. Those non-human cells, collectively called our microbiomes, are essential for us to live. We need to protect those essential and life-supporting foreign non-human cells. Doing so keeps us strong so we can repair damaged cells and create new ones from the nutrition our microbiome helps us to digest and so our immune systems can defend against any dangerous foreign cells. So we don't always do a good job of managing our relationships with any of our communities, from the tiniest of our microbiomes to the largest and most grand in the cosmos, to those we, with whom we show a, share a planet, a country, a neighborhood, or even a home. So the reason for this is that there are polarities of belief and values in our families, among friends, in communities, and the polarities are causing deep rifts. Humans fight humans in wars and in their own countries. Um, Black Lives Matter is a big example of that, where police are, are targeting um, black youths, uh, especially black youths in hoodies. And it's, it's become a, a real problem where innocent, pe innocent black people are being killed by police. Humans have damaged the planet itself with our huge carbon footprint and our waste. We are part of the earth and we humans have not done well at all in managing the planet. We have not protected it from the effects of our actions. And so the planet itself is in turmoil as evidenced by the severe fires, floods, droughts, and windstorms happening all around the planet. So as a result, the planet's in crisis. And so it's for the common good of the planet and everything living on it and, and in the future. Humans are also killing off um, species of animals by destroying their habitats uh, for our own use, you know, like cutting down forests, um, by hunting and po poaching, uh, and by our actions in, in their natural um, habitats. So uh, our, our actions that cause fires, for example, that destroy their, their habitats. So we're doing a lot of things that are, are killing off animal species. Uh, marine mammals is one of them, and they are frequently um, struck by ships or caught in fishing nets that are, are in the sea. So there's many problems that we humans are causing. 
And we're part of the cosmos too, and we've already deposited tons of waste um, as satellites, which are no longer effective and are, are orbiting the planet. And you know, as time goes on, there will be more and more of this space garbage. So not only are we polluting our planet, but we're polluting our, our space. So I see all of these signs as, as telling us that we need to be much, much more careful with our connections to our various communities. Um, and I'll explain later why that's even more important to those of us who are living with chronic pain or fibromyalgia. So you would think that we would know what we're doing as far as just living life and living on the planet, but we don't, clearly. We need to do a better job at to manage all of our relationships with our parts within, with who we share space, um, whether that's our known friends or strangers, and with everything that we're part of. Failure to do this well as humanity and as individuals has caused tremendous stress personally and globally in safety, personal health, finances, abundance, including food and supply issues. Stress and trauma cause symptoms which invite change and only change will solve or relieve the problems. So change is the solution to all problems. Uh, Einstein told us that doing the same things and expecting new results is the definition of insanity. So if you want to get new results, you need to make change. A crazy world is a result of doing things that don't work or that work but have harmful effects long past a safety point. The crazy world is not our fault but it is a human responsibility to change. Change is how the planet and all its inhabitants evolve. Our seeing problems as crises to fear keeps us in stress. Our recognizing that stressors invite or demand change and evolution by creating the absolute need for change, a signal that change is or will be coming or that we need to make changes. For those of us with health challenges, including fibromyalgia or other chronic pain and fatigue, we need to make changes. We need to know that we deserve and owe it to ourselves to practice self-care for and of ourselves and including all of our component parts. We need to learn to heal ourselves. The more aware we are of who we are and how we work and how what is around us works, and what is going on inside and all around us, the better we can do. There's lots of room for learning, discussion, and practicing together. I'm gonna to take a little pause right here. And um, Leah, are there, are there any questions that I should address? And if, if not, let me just say that um, anybody watching, feel free to ask questions in the chat and uh, Leah will let me know. Okay, take a sip of water. So Leah, this is the first time you're hearing or seeing this. Any questions from you? Is this all seeming clear to you? Yes, Seems clear? clear? Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. So what's the fastest and most effective way to make change since there's clearly lots of change going on and lots of change we need to make? Energetically is the fastest way to make change. Okay. The speed of light is, you know, pretty fast. <laughs> and so if you make, you're making changes energetically it can actually happen that fast. So we're spiritual beings at our essence. We are energy beings with a powerful electromagnetic field. Scientific discovery of quantum physics revealed that the space that surrounds us is also energy and that we are all connected to each other and to all that is by this energetic space between us. So there is no separation. Um, the way the energetic connection works is that we connect with that which is most like us. 
So we know that is true because we have communities like family, schools, churches, and places we work where we're with others who are in some way like us. We pick our friends or they pick us based on how alike we are and on shared history, culture, values, and interests. So we attract more of who and what we are, what we focus on, what is like us, and our feelings, values, and results. When, they, when humanity is focused on um, using the resources of the planet for profit, then they're focusing on the profit and not and and harming the resources. So we need to be much more careful of that going forward. So the fastest way to change our results is to change our energy, to raise it up by cho changing our focus from what we don't want to what we do want, thinking and feeling what we would like to have as if we already have it now. So not worrying about whether or not you will get what you want in the future, but actually feeling, yeah, I want this and I know, you know, knowing what it will feel like to, to have that bit of success, whether it's in your business, in your relationship, just know what that feels like and stay with that, you know, come, come at uh, life from that perspective instead of the perspective of, of uh, focusing on the pain or the fatigue or the issues that are our problems. We humans tend to focus on what we don't want instead of what we do. And the biggest change that we need to make is changing that so that we focus on what we do want instead of what we don't want. Being in community with people with similar results attracts more of the same. So most fibromyalgia support groups are depressing because they're only uh, point or, or way of connection is through their results. They're together only because they have fibromyalgia and are in pain, um, so they have a shared illness. Our group uh, is less engaged than some of these other groups because it's, um, it's human nature to complain, to see the negative and to talk about it. And so those groups where, um, where that is encouraged are really, really busy and engaged. And since our group is much more focused on healing, uh, focused on the positive, it's less engaged because people don't quite know how to do that yet. It's something new. So there's interest in the group, um, people belong to it, and I don't know how often they're looking uh, because we don't see that. We only see when somebody actually makes a comment. Um, but it, it's interesting um, to, to recognize that the negative tends to be more popular because and it's not that it's more popular it's that we don't even have to think of it to do um the focus on negativity because that's how uh, we're conditioned that's how humanity survived tigers and dinosaurs before that and you know whatever was around that was dangerous um, by con constantly looking around for danger uh, humans could run from it they could hide from it uh, they could play dead um, and so humanity lived. But we don't need that anymore. Now we, uh, we don't have the same kind of dangers that we're facing. And our, our evolution hasn't quite caught up to how daily, uh, daily living is working. So in, in our group, as I said, there's, there's a little negativity expressed. It's clearly not the nature of the group, which reflects me and my values because I started the group. So, um, and, um, and I wanted to keep reflecting me and my values because I'm trying to bring hope to our community that it is possible for us to heal fibromyalgia uh, and to talk, no, that's not true. We're not, here's an edit, will you mark this time, Leah, so Lens can get this. Um, what we're trying to do is heal ourselves. Uh, that's, that's the focus of the group is, is to, to learn how to heal ourselves so that we uh, resolve any underlying conditions that are causing our pain and fatigue and our illness and can and can live well and happily. So my belief and experience tells me that we can heal ourselves. Um, I have. Um, and so I mean I remember being work disabled for 
20 years. And all of that cost me um, in pain and suffering in, in lost income and in, in all of those things. I, I know what that experience is and, or was. And I know what my current experience is having gone through uh, or discovered and gone through the various different ways of healing that that actually healed me underneath uh, the pain and fatigue and allowed me to get well. So in, in our health, as in the world around us, crazy results are not our fault, um, but it is our responsibility to change um, to change them, you know, uh, if, if we don't like our pain and fatigue and there's no cure, the only alternative is to, there's two alternatives, stay sick or heal yourself. Um, sorry, I wish there were lots of other alternatives, but that's what we get to, cho to, to choose from, um, staying miserable or learning to make changes that will cause our wellness. So we need to change our attention, our fo what we focus on, change our thoughts and our feelings, our beliefs, and our values. That's the purpose of the full paid program. And free trainings are brief. So you know we can only address one piece at a time. And here I am reading and talking really fast to get this, <laughs> this one lesson through uh, on, for, for this month. But, um, there is a full program available and you're welcome to um, to book a call to to discuss that at any time and you can also always um, just ask something in the group too that's that's available to you. Uh, Leah and I are available to you um, whenever you reach out to us. So being in community with others whose attention is on making healthy changes on evolving into a better and healthier state and on values and beliefs that are in alignment with these ideas provides a support. Being guided by and in, communicate in, in community with others who have already made changes to change their results to become healthier, inspires, motivates, instructs, and supports us to change. And we have had other people who have um, healed themselves uh, join us in discussion during some of these um, live events and uh, you know share how, how well they are feeling instead of how poorly they are feeling so that, that's something that I'm very proud of. So daily attention to a new healthy way of focusing our attention of knowing what we value and want of managing our thoughts expressing our feelings as they arrive instead arise instead of stuffing them um, and daily practices to support ourselves on each level of being will help us to get better um, i don't focus on the problems of pain and fatigue specifically because i know that that attracts more pain and fatigue so i focus on um, the, the the changes that we can make that will heal us rather than focusing on the problems. I know the problems are there. I'm not ignoring uh, your problems, uh, but the, if the, we make our problems the focus of our attention, um, we're, we're going to attract more and more of it. It's real easy for our body to give us more pain, uh, to make us more tired. Um, and focusing on what we want instead is just as easy once we make it a habit but it does require some, some work to make it, uh, make it a habit. Focusing on what we do want instead and thinking of it as it's already true, uh, we can feel like it's already true. So if we think it's already true, we feel it's already true. If we imagine it's already true, that's the same as if it were true. Our brain can't tell the difference. And so when we, we add the, the imagining it as if we've already got the health that we want, as, as if we already feel the way we want, and focus on how good that feels, and do it consistently, um, we can actually start to, to change because we're creating new neural pathways in our brain. Alternating between the two, between th thinking of what we don't want, the pain and fatigue, and sometimes thinking about how we want it to be isn't enough. We have to make a, a change so that we're focusing primarily 
on what we do want instead of primarily on what we don't want. And so that's, that's, that's a challenge. So we need to stop focusing on pain and fatigue and replace it with focusing on how we do want to feel and what else we want in life. In the group, and we talk about healing ourselves and our wounds and the underlying conditions that cause our pain, fatigue and symptoms. We talk about how to get good quality, deep sleep. We talk about how to manage stress in our lives. We talk about how to manage pain with movement. And we talk about things that can help to relieve pain. And feel free to ask any questions um, that you have in the group. Um, the group is here to, um, to learn together, to share together. So feel free to use it. Um, and the only exception to that is that I don't um, give medical advice. So we don't talk about, um, for example, medications. Medications are uh, the responsibility of your doctor. Um, and, and you can talk with your doctor or pharmacist about medication questions. One moment, please. So we humans are, are social and connection is really important to us. While we enjoy some time alone and uh, tend to withdraw when we're in pain, exhausted or feeling unwell, we still do need that, con that connection. Uh, humans thrive with connection. As a species, we survive and we learn and we, um, we just grow with connection. And these connections, we've got connection to self and, you know, and, and learning about that is you know, who and what am I? What are my parts? Am I wounded? Yes, you're human, so you're wounded. You know, <laughs> that's just the way it is. Um, what are my wounds? What are my beliefs? What do I want? And we do this by, by using the time that we're alone um, to think about these things. And it, it, it's valuable work and it is healing work. We're also connected to our own spirit, our essence within us that is, um, it's who's looking out at the world, who's making all these observations, who is in here in this uh, four body earth suit that is, you know, running the show. And we have, we have interruptions from our, from our thoughts uh, and from our um, subconscious, our, our feelings, our memories, uh, but our divinity is, is underneath and it's, well, not underneath as in physically underneath because it's, it's, it's big, it's energy, it's expansive. Um, and where it is doesn't matter as much as what it is. You know, we are a piece of divinity and uh, that's really important to know and to remember. And when we're in connection with our own spirit, we can recognize that we're also in connection with God and with everything else that surrounds us. There's also connection to nature that is important to us. Any of us who have pets know that. Uh, any of us who like to go and walk in the woods or walk along a beach, uh, look at mountains, <clears throat> look out at the ocean. <clears throat> That's part of our, our connection to, to nature, to the planet. Um, we ground by walking barefoot on grass, by walking barefoot in the sand, and we just become more connected with the earth. We feel more solid, uh, like we're not going to fall off. <laughs> you know, the planet's gravity connects us to the planet, and we are connected to it. We are also connected to others, whether that's a partner, family, child, friend, co-worker, client, customer, neighbor, stranger, a foreigner, or people who are geographically removed. And interestingly, many people think that people who live in other parts of the world are foreigners. Well, no, people who live in other parts of the world are not foreign in their own country. <laughs> they might look like foreigners when they come and visit us in our countries, and we are foreigners when we visit their company, countries, but yeah. That's not the way it works. Geographically removed, it does not make 
people foreign. <laughs> we're, we're all at home in our own countries. And besides connection to others, there's recognition of, to, of others. And that reckon, when we get to the point where we recognize that everyone is connected and that we're all divine, when we can actually say namaste and know that what we're really saying is the divinity in me acknowledges the divinity in you. Um, so that's that's another connection. So those are these are really important connections that when we when they are working for us, we feel more solid, we feel more alive, we feel healthier. Um, it's just it's important, and it doesn't feel very important if you're sick. Um, you know when you're feeling a lot of pain, when you're in in a, in a terrible flare or when you're just zonked, exhausted, it doesn't feel like these connections are important, but they still are. And when you keep these connections alive and thriving, it helps. Um, so it's, it's worth the, the time and attention to, to um, acknowledge all of these connections and to keep them alive and flowing even when you're not feeling well, because the connection is so important that it can also, also be part of our healing. And disconnection is part of the problem. So we have to acknowledge that disconnection is part of the problem. And yes, I did it too. I definitely withdrew from the entire world when I, was, when I first crashed from fibromyalgia. And I stayed disconnected for a long time. And when I came back, I was only happy on Zoom because I wasn't with people. <laughs> but energetically, I was with people. Um, and it's, it's important that we're comfortable being around other people. And while we mightn't be comfortable with everyone, we can choose to be around those people with whom we are comfortable. Um, and that's, that's in our highest good. So we benefit from our connection to others. Uh, love, sex, assistance, the survival of the species. You know, we can't do <clears throat> everything alone. You know, one isn't a farmer and a uh, shoemaker and a, and, a, and a clothing maker and a cook. Uh, you, we can't, you know, it's hard for, uh, for any of us to be all of the things we need. But in cooperation, in community, we don't have to. We benefit from being among others and especially families and friends with whom we have a lot in common. And yeah, sometimes we outgrow our family because somebody in the family, their beliefs have changed and there's no longer any residence or understanding. And that happens often. Um, and get ready for it, Leah, because it starts with teen years. <laughs> you're a ways off yet, but you're, you're gonna be a mom to a teen soon. So sometimes we need to disconnect with someone who is toxic to us. Um, there's lots of people in our families. Um, I don't mean lots of people in any one of our families, but you know, in families in general, um, many of us have someone who is toxic. And you know, we don't need to be closely connected to that person. And depending on how toxic the person is, the relationship is, we can walk away from it. We don't have to fight with it we can just kind of remove ourselves from the situation. And that's true also in a workplace environment. If you're in a toxic work environment, it's better to find yourself a new job, a new career even, than it is to stay in an environment that is toxic to you. And sometimes we need to grow to match our current condition and our needs to, uh, to get the support that we need from the group that we already have. So, you know, we need to recognize that we can't expect people to know what we need. We need to be able to communicate with them and we need to have patience with them. And, you know, that's, that takes some growth when you're in a lot of pain, when you're exhausted. So we need to match our current condition and needs to the support that's currently available. Sometimes we choose our family, our partner, uh, our ex external or the extended family, our friends, coach, guide, mentors, teachers, 
uh, groups, communities, so we can grow with them. And that's an easier way to grow because it is supported. Uh, it's a lot easier to do things in community than it is to do them alone. And that's, that's certainly true uh, for those of us with fibromyalgia, as it is for everyone else. And the other way of connection that is on our planet are social structures. And these social structures are created for certain purposes, um, or they evolve from certain values. They can work really well and be supportive, um, but they may not work well for the whole. They may not work well for everyone, for all life forms, for the planet and beyond. Um, some benefit only a few, you know, like the rotten rich uh, are, are benefited from, from only, uh, from benefit from some of these um, structures. Um, and most of us benefit from many of the structures, but not from all of the structures. So some of the responses, um, oh, some of the structures are responses to what has not been working. And um, in, in Canada, that would be um, indigenous reconciliation, um, because it, it, one of the dark spots on the history of Canada is that uh, children were removed from indigenous families and put in residential schools where they were taught English and, and taught Christianity, and basically their culture was being removed from them. Um, so there's, and, and a lot of them died and were, were buried in unmarked graves. I mean, there's a, there's a, a lot of, you know, uh, real serious dark spots in history uh, about that. And so because of that problem, groups have come up and there's a whole movement for indigenous recognition reconciliation and that's going on all over the world in different examples so we're seeing lots of dramatic evidence of structures falling of governments falling of regimes falling um, of uh, regimes like, like um, oh, in Afghanistan the terrorists are back in power Taliban are back in power and so the, all of the improvements that were made in the lives of women and girls, like they're being able to get an education, is gone again um, because the Taliban are back in power. So as these structures change in and out, the effects can be really good or they can be really bad. Um, in Canada right now, the um, socialized system of healthcare is at great risk. Um, Post pandemic, it's collapsing under the, the weight of all of the need um, because things like surgeries, tests, mammograms, MRIs, all of these things were postponed into the future because people weren't going into health facilities because of, of the pandemic. And so now there's long wait lists. Um, and 15% and of the population of Canada now doesn't have a family doctor. And since a family doctor is, is how we access all of the parts of, of um, healthcare, we don't have, many, many of us don't have access, uh, access. So I've recently become one of them again because my doctor moved to another province in Canada. So Canada didn't lose a doctor in that process, but patients in the province he's moving to will get a doctor and the patients that he has here will lose a doctor. And so right now there's about 15% of Canadians without, without a family doctor. So even though our, our healthcare system is socialized and that, that's a great idea because everyone has it um, equally, um, but when it's, when it's uh, overburdened, um, everyone doesn't have it equally. <laughs> so this is a, a, an, an idea that may be a little different to some people, but I'll, I'll just bring it up. Um, the shift uh, and disconnection and change, transition, transformation, awareness of oneness. Okay, That's the topic of this little, next little bit that we'll be talking about. So many dramatic changes, including climate change, are happening energetically. I said at the beginning of this that that's the fastest way for change to happen is when it's energetic change. And many of these things are happening simultaneously. The energy and the speed of change is escalating. 
So that's causing stress because we're constantly, constantly facing, facing changes. In spiritual circles, all of this is considered to be part of a huge energetic and spiritual shift that's happening right now. And it's been anticipated for many years. It has more or less become mainstream thought, but not everyone is aware of it. So it's not quite mainstream, okay? So Eckhart a a a a Tolle is um, a, a spiritual leader and, and writer. And he has said, there's a shift happening in humanity, a shift in consciousness happening now because it has to happen now. That's interesting. So there's enough problems in, or in the world and enough need for change that this stuff is just kind of happening. And, and, and the, the, like in Canada with the healthcare, the actual weight of the problem is starting to cause, cause some of the shifts. Once we notice these interesting changes, the shift happens to us too, because we'll suddenly become aware of it. And that's what it takes, awareness. We don't notice something until we do. And after we do, we see things differently than we did before. So that's pretty much what the spiritual shift does. It changes the way we see the world, people, life, and everything else under the sun, moon, and stars, and even those beyond our solar system and galaxy. But it doesn't happen to all of us at once. Some people resist it with all of their force. And they would like to go back to the times when everybody thought the earth was flat and we had a sun and a moon and that's all there was, you know. Um, so there are still people resisting and some people are going forward with this and saying, oh, yes, it's got to change. Let's go faster, faster. Um, so there's there's a, a huge spectrum of, of how people are reacting to all of these changes. So the people who are resisting this and the people who are embracing this kind of explain what's going on with, with that's causing all of the polarity and divisiveness and the chaos in the world. It will reach a tipping point um, and th with the direction of, of oneness and wholeness over duality and polarity. But we clearly aren't there yet. Where we are is right in the middle of it. So we're right in the middle of all of this change, all of this turmoil, and it feels stressful it feels excessive we're all part of the collective consciousness which is all of the thoughts beliefs feelings and moral attitudes of humanity and you know if you look at any one of us or any some of us we can we, we can have a lot of commonality but when you look at all of humanity there's a lot of divergent beliefs and so there is a lot of um, a polarity between these, two, th these beliefs until it's recognized that, that we're all one, that we're all connected. And when that's happening, um, the focus becomes on oneness, on, on the state of being one with all that is and our all being um, connected. So there are things that we can do to become um, comfortable and part of the shift. I mean, we're part of the shift, whether we want to or not. It's, the, it's what's it's happening energetically, but we can become comfortable with it by being in the now, focusing on what you're doing in the moment, even if it's just breathing. Uh, just focus on your breath and you reconnect with now. You can't worry about the past or the present when you're definitely in the now. Uh, look people in the eye and listen. Don't just talk um, aimlessly. And, uh, and listen only to get your answer out. The idea of listening is to actually hear, <laughs> to actually connect with a, another human being and exchange uh, information, energy, maybe even love. Um, so look people in the eye and really listen. Use words carefully, you know, be kind. Uh, see and treat everyone as an equal because we are equal. We're spirit, all spiritual beings, and so we're equal. Um, but that certainly isn't how it feels in daily life, and, and, until we, unless we actually focus on that. Everyone on the planet is spiritual family, as we're, we're all connected spiritually. So 
by not judging, being kind, forgiving, being generous, being grateful, and loving, we can um, work towards more peace with that connection and start to feel part of the oneness instead of feeling like we're part of the chaos. Um, and, and that's that's where the shift is is taking us. So understanding and accepting that these huge changes are necessary for the evolution of humanity and the planet makes it all make more sense. Suddenly the chaos isn't so bad. It's like, oh, that's why all this stuff is happening. Um, and it feels good. Um, and the more we can get into um, that approach to it, instead of being afraid of all that is happening, the, the more relaxed, unstressed, and ready to heal we're going to be. So people have been talking about the shift for decades. It's become mainstream now about, among people who consider themselves spiritual, but, but not religious. Um, as for example, people talking about the dawning of the age of Aquarius, and we are in the age of Aquarius right now, which is supposedly a much more peaceful and loving time in the history of, of uh, our world. Um, and it's because of the focus on oneness. And uh, um, regarding the age of Aquarius specifically, uh, that's all done based on astrology. But it doesn't matter what system you use, you know, the same results are coming up from wherever you look at it. So I became aware of the anticipated shift while I was living in Hawaii around 1996, when I met my first energetic healer. Um, uh, who wrote a book called The Shift, and it was the first I had ever heard of it, and I've, I've followed some of it since, and I just find that it is, it's, it's good to have some explanation that makes all of the stuff that's happening, all of the changes that are happening, make some sense. So that's why, to me, um, the, the massive changes aren't as, as, as frightening to me as I know that they are to many people. Um, so understanding or accepting the idea of the shift or of structural changes going on is not necessary to heal, but it is um, helpful to heal. It, it just puts us in a place of being open to healing, of being connected uh, to each other, to everything. And when we are more open and connected, healing is, is, is simpler. But if you think it's nonsense, <laughs> that's your right. And you don't need, you know, thinking about the shift is, is not essential to healing. It's just, a, it's another tool. It's another perspective. Um, and so I offer it to you as that, as a perspective that you can choose or that you can not choose or that you can choose no <laughs> as your reaction to. So those of us who are aware of it are just more open to healing because we know very deeply that life is energetic. Um, many who are, are aware of it and really em empathic feel a lot of the energy in, in some of the shifts as they're happening. Some people say they even feel solar flares. Okay, I'm not going to say that's not true, but I can't tell when there's solar flares. Um, I tend to know when the moon is full, though. I mean, that, you know, life gets a little crazier for me on a full moon, but we're all different. So, you know, we all react differently to different energies. Um, I totally enjoy the energy of being in nature. Um, so we need to accept or, or consider what resonates with us, what makes us comfortable. And and because we're healing us, we're not healing anyone else. So making choices that are good for us and for our connections with ourselves, with divinity and with others um, makes that job easier. And the next section in this presentation that I put together is on connection and responsibility. So who's responsible for us? For, for what in life? Every competent adult is responsible for herself or himself. Um, we're responsible for ourselves. No one else is responsible for us. No one else is responsible for our health, for our happiness, uh, for our well-being. We are responsible for ourselves. To be successful, our actions um, in being responsible must not harm another. 
okay? Um, other adults are responsible for themselves. We're not responsible for anybody else's happiness, um, nor are they responsible for ours. And that's one of the problems in life is that we expect somebody else to make us happy, or they expect us to make them happy, and that's not the rules. <laughs> um, we are responsible, though, for children until they become adults. And, and that's why family is, is such a big and important structure uh, in society. You know, uh, family exists to take care to, and to nurture and to teach children how to become, you know, proper little humans. So what is it that we're responsible? We're responsible for our own lives and for our results, including our emotional state. We can choose to be in fear and worry or we can choose to have faith, hope, happiness, and love. And that's a spectrum. <laughs> uh, we can be anywhere in along there, but it, th there, these are choices that we actually can make. We all get to choose our preferred emotional state and we can create the state that we feel. So we don't wait for somebody else to make us happy. We decide that we want to be happy and we make that happen by doing things that make us happy. Uh, by doing things that resolve problems, because the absence of problems and stress makes us feel happier. Um, so it's, it's within our control, even though it often doesn't feel like it is. When we're happy, we know that we have complete um, choice in the matter. But when we're fearful, we aren't recognizing that we still have that choice. Um, because we get stuck in the, in the emotions of, of, of fear and worry. So our, one of these choices clearly feels better than the other, but not everyone chooses the feel-good option. Um, most people don't even know that they can choose their emotional state. They're just, you know, I feel this, and they think it's real, and they think it's the only choice for them at that moment. But if you think about something really pleasant and wonderful that brought you great joy um, that can make you feel good even when there's something terrible going on around you even when there's something terrible going on to you um, what we focus on can make us feel better certain practices can help us to do that on repeat and it even becomes automatic when we make being optimistic being happy um, being positive instead of always looking at what's wrong in the situation. When we make those um, our preferred state, then it, it just becomes who we are. It becomes how we be. And it certainly affects how we feel. And in order to feel well, we need to get out of the fear and worry and get more into uh, a more positive state of, of peace and, and love, of, of, of having hope. Uh, it's not a matter of, of needing to be completely well to feel that. We just have faith, we hope, uh, we believe in ourselves, we believe in our power and our strength, our ability to learn and our ability to change. And so that can make us happy, just hoping for what's right and, and having faith in that um, can, can allow us to be happy. So we can be, do, think, feel, love, and create better when we feel good. So it's important for us to do that. We all experience fear sometimes, and some more than others. Um, we can only manage some things in life. So there are going to be some things that are simply out of our control. We can manage um, those that with, are, are within our, our own life within our own future. And we can manage fears about our future um, by taking responsible action. But most other things in life, like wars, extinctions, raging fires, floods, and other catastrophes, and healing the earth are outside of our control. Um, making sure that you have food to eat is, is within most of our control. Um, but solving 
a forest fire in another country is completely outside of our control. So we need to um, make the choice not to give prolonged focus to the problems in life that don't directly affect us and that are outside of our control. Worrying about them, fearing them, serves no purpose. So um, the best thing to do is just not do it because all it does is drag us down. Um, it's better to, to focus on what is within our control because we can do something about it. We can make changes to suit that. So why is it hard to focus on the faith, hope, happiness, and love, the good, the feeling good stuff over, um, over fear? And what can we do about it? Well, it's a challenge um, to choose not to, to focus on the negative because humans are still hardwired for that as part of our um, survival system. So it's so that we would see dangers. Uh, fears arise so that we can um, have hormones uh, pumping and having adrenaline running so that we're ready to run, so that we have the strength to fight, um, so that we freeze or so that we play dead. Um, so that's just a, a natural part of our instinct where focusing on the positive actually requires some conscious thought. And so it's, it's using a, instead of the, the fight, flight, or freeze response is in, in the most ancient part of our brain, the amygdala. And the choosing the, the hope and happiness uh, approach instead is from our neocortex. It's the most, um, the newest part of the brain and the most advanced. And so what we have to actually shift out of, of the, the ancient part of the brain and get up into the, uh, into the, uh, the neocortex uh, at the front of the brain. It's, so it's, what's, what's hard about it is only that it's not automatic. The, the fight, flight, or freeze, that's, that, that response that makes us see the negative is a, re a survival reaction. Um, we're thinking about and having hope is a, a mental function that's more advanced. So it's not that it's so much harder to do as that it's not the automatic setting. So we have to practice it, and by practicing it a lot, we're creating new neural pathways in our brain that actually make a make we're creating paths so that we will actually go there more often and the more often we go there the better the path becomes and soon it could become a super highway and we can just just go there automatically instead of going to the negative automatically so life isn't um terrible everywhere um there's uh, a lot to be grateful for uh, it's a hot life affirming emotion and we can bring that on any time by just thinking about what we're grateful. We've can, we can actually bring that feeling to ourselves uh, by just thinking about it. It's a simple practice and it can turn our lives from fear and negativity to love and happiness very quickly. Um, and it's an easy habit to create. Life's not terrible, even though a lot is going on in a lot of places. Avoid jumping to the conclusion that life is terrible just because there are lots of problems and they're visible. That's a thinking error. Remember, people with fibromyalgia, visible does not mean real and important. And invisible does not mean not real and unimportant. People with fibromyalgia or in other um, invisible illnesses really ought to remember that. We don't like it when people um, think our illness isn't real because it's not invisible or it's not visible. Um, so the, the, this, the same is true with everything. We can't um, have a bias um, for visible over invisible when we have a problem with other people having that bias towards us because our illness is in invisible. Participating in life as much as we can makes it easier to see what's great about life. You know, if we stay home, in our beds and just feel the pain. Um, that's not fully participating in life. And while it's perfectly understandable, because you know, feeling miserable feels miserable. <laughs> and so sometimes we need to do this, but we don't need to do this um, constantly. 
And by doing it constantly, we're making it worse more than making it better. And if you improve to, you know, participating a little more time or participating with people who are going to make you feel better or participating by doing something that's going to make you feel a little bit better, then that's a good thing. And just participating in your own illness is another way of keeping attention stuck on it. And we got to break that. We got to not have us so focused on our illness that it takes over our lives. And fibromyalgia is something that really can take over our lives very, very easily. And I'm not suggesting in any way that any of this is to say that it's not real. It's real. Um, and if this is not a mind over matter, poof, we can do this. But it is, um, the fact is that when we, when we do what we're doing and expect to get new results, it doesn't work. We need to change what we're doing if we're going to get new results. And so um, it, it's important, it, it, it's important to remember that. And uh, hard to learn it the first time, but when you get it, it's like these big lights go on in your head and it's like, oh. <laughs> and for 20 years, I didn't get it. Um, you know, and, and I, I went with the suffering. I went with the you'll never get better. I went with all of the things that people told me about it and all of the things that my body was feeling about it. And when I finally broke out of that, it's like energy's back. You know, pain is, you know, not 100% gone. I mean, hey, I'm 69, there are, there's pain in my body sometimes. Um, but it doesn't consume me like it did when I was in my mid 40s. Um, and that it did, you know, until about four years ago. So uh, many of us with um, fibromyalgia also have a heightened nervous system. So, um, and, and a heightened emotional response. That can be due to um, experiences of trauma, uh, which affect the brain, the body, and the, our entire system. Some of us have an, a dysregulated uh, nervous system and we're sympathetic dominant, which means that we're always feeling the, the instinct to run. We're always feeling the instinct to fight. Um, and people are promoting fighting fibromyalgia. But when we're fighting fibromyalgia, we're, getting, we're keeping ourselves in that sympathetic state, which is pumping hormones um, and keeping us on edge. So what we need to do is, is, is stop the dominance of the sympathetic state um, so that we can get back into the rest and digest state, which is called parasympathetic, which is very confusing. Those two words sound much too much alike <laughs> because they're completely opposite. Um, but when we're in this sympathetic state, we're always, um, hypervigilant, we're kind of waiting for something to happen uh, because we're in this, you know, we're in the old part of the brain in the, in the, uh, the state from the amygdala and it can trigger us and we can get triggered by something that happens in the present that's little, but it reminds us unconsciously, it, it, it brings up something that happened in the past that's kind of like it in some, some small, you know, in, in some way they're, they're linked. And so that triggers us and we feel, we feel the old event again. So it's taking us out of the present and back into uh, traumatic memories. And there are processes that we can use to, to handle being triggered and to release um, so, some of the emotion that's coming up, just release it and let it go and, and love ourselves. Um, and so this again is, is self-healing. So the last thing that I wanted to, to say is that it's, it's really important that we find ourselves, our essence, the spirit, the immortal part of us. It's in here. This isn't just something that you know, goes to heaven when we die. It's, it's, it's here with us all the time. It's who we are. It's what's um, causing our life to be. It's, 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 it's why we're here on this planet, to grow our soul, to learn, um, to recognize that we're all one. Um, and, you know, life on earth 
gives us lots of challenges that cause us to grow. And, you know, fibromyalgia is a nice big challenge and it's a nice big opportunity to grow. Probably you don't think about it that way, but when you're on the other side, you will say, yeah, she was right. Fibromyalgia is an opportunity to grow. It's an opportunity to learn. It's a really hard way to do it, but it does it. So if you look deep inside yourself to the quiet space between your thoughts, you'll, that's where you find your essence, your spirit. Your spirit isn't all the thoughts running around in your head and some of them can be good and some of them can be bad and it's, you know, kind of can be kind of a war in there. And, and I used to think I had a war in there, but there's peace in there now and peace sure feels better than, than the war does. So come to your spirit self often, twice daily is ideal and reconnect to who and what you are uh, and to what all harm humans are beneath, beneath our thoughts, values, beliefs, egos, and feelings. You can pray for whoever needs it from that space. And we're talking, you know, directly to God when we do that. We're part of God and we're talking to him when we're, when we're in this space where we're connected to our own spirit. If you find it hard to meditate, um, you may wish to visit your spirit, but spirit doesn't allow us to come in with our busy mind. Um, and so temporarily, we have to put aside our thoughts. Just kind of let them go, pretend you're going into, you know, the, the, the sacred chamber of, of the, the spirit, and you got to leave the garbage outside. <laughs> and you got to leave the treasures outside. You leave everything outside, and you go into the sacred chamber with nothing but yourself. And so you go in there, and you, you the only thoughts and feelings it's okay to bring into this chamber are love and peace. Other than that, it all stays outside. And so when you get in the chamber, there you are. There's nothing left but you, but the spirit. And you have an opportunity there since you've left everything outside, uh, metaphorically, to, to just be with spirit, to just be with the core part of you and, and feel the beauty and wonder of that. And that is healing. That's why people meditate twice a day. Um, it's because it's really, really good for us. Some people um, use prayer as a way to do that instead of meditation, and they actually recite prayers or sing hymns or chant. There's many other ways to do this. Um, meditation seems to be a really popular way right now, and it's an easy way. Um, it's, it's only not easy if you try to make it complicated, it's just simple. Just focus on your breath, leave everything outside except you and your breath and your spiritual essence and, and you'll find peace. And peace is healing. So get to know your spirit self. It's the essence of you. It's the essence of everyone else and everything else. And it's all connected. It's the ultimate connection and community. It's the ultimate in healing. And so that's why we use this spiritual help approach. And um, that's why I think it's better than anything medicine can offer it because it's, it's much deeper. It's spirit to spirit. And uh, that's how we can get well. So that's my presentation for today. I, I talked a lot. Um, this uh, recording will be available and the document will be available too. Um, you might enjoy reading it better more than listening to it, but you have the choice because both will be uh, provided in the guide section in the group. So uh, are there any questions or anything happening in chat, Leah? We got Debbie. She said, hi. Hi, Debbie, how are you doing? Is Debbie, is Debbie in the group or is Debbie on Zoom? Debbie in the group. In watching the group. Live. Well, yeah, hi, Debbie. Good. Glad you're here watching us live. And um, yeah. yeah, that's great. So thank you for being with us. It's always good to have somebody uh, on with us live. But um, this is uh, the same energy comes through with this, whether you're watching it live or watching a replay. And so I hope lots of you take a look at this and 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 get something from it. Okay. So thank All you, right. and and um, we will see you with with something next month. Um, 
I may make some changes to um, to whatever we had announced. I forget what we have for September, but we'll see, we'll see you in September. We'll see you in September. Okay, so continue to have a wonderful summer, winter, depending on where you are. Um, take care of yourselves. Uh, love yourselves. Forgive yourselves. Um, you know, we live uh, frequently in a lot of self-blame, a lot of self-doubt, and doing all of that stuff over and over and over just prevents any healing. So try to get out of those bad habits and um, adopt some of the, the new habits that we're suggesting and that the shift is, is bringing about in, in the whole world. Thank you and namaste. Goodbye, Leah. <laughs>